of always of always being exactly on time have started to break down a little bit as we transitioned out of the pain. So perfect. So welcome everybody uh, to this webinar on uh, scenarios communication. Um, this webinar is being hosted by Iconics. Uh, and just I thought um, before we dive into the subject at hand today, I will just say a few words about Iconics and maybe some other things to, to be watching out for. Um, Iconics is, as many of you know already, the International Committee on New Integrated Climate Change Assessment Scenarios. We have Tim Carter to thank for that acronym. It was a tough job. Uh, it started around 2012-ish. It was maybe 2013 before we had the Iconics name. And it was created to facilitate, at that time, the development of the SSPs, and, and particularly filling a, a, a gap in bringing people together from the impacts adaptation vulnerability community and the emissions mitigation community. Um, and later also including the physical science of climate change, that community as well. Um, and so now since the, the SSPs have been developed, it facilitates the, the continued development, um, modifications, new directions, uh, and also the use of the SSP framework. Um, the Iconics has organized two forums so far, which many of you probably attended. Uh, one was in Denver in 2019, and then just recently at IATA uh, earlier this summer was the second forum. And the aim is to have another one uh, in two or three years. Um, in addition to these forums uh, for bringing the scenarios community get together, um, Iconics has also organized and hosted a, a, a series of webinars, um, mainly to address issues that are either coming up to be discussed in the next forum or have come out of the last one as identified by the community as important topics to, to dive into uh, further. Um, we had about five webinars last year. This year, we had one earlier this month on key insights from the forum that uh, occurred in June. We'll have another one in the near future, two or three months from now, on uh, updating the scenario drivers, population, and, and uh, economic growth projections that underlie the SSPs. Um, so that's that's Iconics, and you can sign up for uh, an email list uh, to stay informed about these things. I'll put the, the web link in the, in the chat um, in a minute. Uh, and then just one word about communications as a topic uh, in scenarios. Um, it's a really important topic. I think it's a, it's a growing importance. Um, we're really grateful that Catherine Leitzel has put together this, this uh, webinar. And we wanted to have a session on this topic for, for some time. It sort of appeared a bit at the forum in June, but not really fully. It really didn't come together in a strong way. So this webinar really is playing a, a really important role in, in getting this topic kind of firmly on the table. Um, so last, just a couple logistics. Um, as we go forward here, please remember to keep yourself on mute. Um, feel free to use the chat. When we do get to the Q&A period, you'll have the opportunity. You can raise your hand electronically and ask questions verbally. That's fine. You can also use the chat. Um, either way, we'll be monitoring that. So let me turn it over to Catherine. Catherine is the, the IPCC communications manager and has worked in science communications for, for many years now and has put together a great webinar. Catherine, over to you. Sorry, I lost my mute button when I shared my screen. Yeah, thank you for having me and thanks for all of our speakers who are coming today. I've put the agenda up on the screen so you can see who we'll be hearing from. Um, but as Brian said, I've been doing science communication for some time and I spent quite some time at EASA. And so I've been connected with the scenarios research community um, for quite a while, since 2012. Um, and so I've really been interested in this topic. And now with IPCC Working Group 1, the topic has kind of come up again. And, um, and 
it's definitely been at the, the forefront of a lot of the communications that we're doing around IPCC and climate change um, in, the, in the current world. So, um, so the idea came up doing this webinar. Um, and as you can see today, we're going to have kind of two aspects of it. We'll have the IPCC experience. We're going to hear from two of the professionals who've been really involved in um, dealing with communicating scenarios. So Sigourney Luz from Working Group 3, and then Arlene Burt, who's got a visual um, communications expertise, and she's been working on the synthesis report. And so they both have some really interesting challenges um, and lessons learned to share, I think. And then James Painter and Susie Marshall, who have been working with me on a, a media analysis, um, rather, they've been working on the media analysis that we asked them to. Um, and so they've been looking at how um, the media are actually covering climate change, or covering scenarios in the context of climate change, and specifically the IPCC reports that have come out over the last year. And then we're going to switch gear and hear from outside of the IPCC and outside of the scenarios research community, because the focus of this webinar is, um, you know, when you're communicating, you're always thinking about what audience are we communicating with. And so to narrow it down a little bit, we decided to focus more on general audiences. And so I wanted to bring together people that you may not hear from in your normal research SSP discussions, um, but people from outside IPCC who, however, are engaging in um in this topic in different and creative ways. So we're hearing from Shreya Jay, who's a journalist in India, from Andrew David Hudson, who's a novelist, um, and from Kirsika, I won't try to say your last name, um, who is a designer in, in Finland who has a really cool project. And so they'll all tell us about their projects. And then there'll be time for questions. And um, our aim here is we're not gonna come away telling you exactly how you should be communicating scenarios. There's lots of uh, expertise out there on, on how to do better science communication, but I think this is an, a newish science topic. It's, uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges, but I think there's also a lot of opportunities in the idea of, you know, multiple different futures um, that maybe can also inform how we communicate climate change more generally, maybe more positively. So yeah, don't expect to get all the answers here, but hopefully you'll come away with some different ideas and some new um, new ideas and some new contacts. And, and yeah, thanks everybody for being here. So we will start with, um, I'm not sure, Arlene or Sigi, are you going? I'm not sure who's going first. I think I'm going first. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Sorry, bear with me a second. Getting there. Okay. Can you can you see that? Yes, we can. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, okay. Thanks, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to cover some of the developments um, from. IPCC Working Group 3 in terms of scenarios, um, mostly from AR5 to AR6. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how scenarios messages um, come from the experts uh, and communicators and how they're consumed. And then I'm going to touch a little bit on some of the more recent issues or challenges that have cropped up for us. I will just say at the beginning of this, um, Catherine, you said that we have quite a lot of experience communicating scenarios, and I would actually disagree with that. I don't think I personally have that much experience communicating scenarios, but we've certainly witnessed and watched a lot of you or IPCC authors doing this. Um, so th this comes from that kind of perspective. Uh, but yes, be kind, because uh, I am not a scientist, but I'm certainly going to share with you what I have. Uh, okay, so to to get first to sorry to get started just first uh, i have a bit of a disclaimer because the ipcc report obviously isn't just about uh doing scenarios we have a very wide-ranging report beyond scenarios and we include stuff like finance and you know sectoral mitigation options and sustainable sustainable development etc uh, but the scenarios definitely cuts across a lot of those chapters uh, and there's a lot of interest in scenarios work from all of the audiences that IPCC works with, but especially from the press, and that feeds into media that's consumed by the public. And of course, we actually don't do scenarios ourselves, we simply assess them. Uh, but there's a very strong overlap in the scientific community, which is very clear uh, with the people who are here today, many of whom I already know. 
Um, now, Arlene is going to cover some of the visual aspects of the figures, uh, but just to briefly demonstrate, uh, in AR5, we had a, I'm just going to see if I can get a laser pointer, oh, there we go, I, I don't know if you can see that, there's like a laser uh, on screen, but in AR5, we had a different kind of categorization to the scenarios, as well as approach to telling the scenario's story, I suppose, so we didn't have um, illustrative mitigation pathways, they didn't exist, but they were certainly demonstrated um, in terms of how different emissions levels were associated with potential pathways or RCPs uh, and how they're linked to developments in society. And you can kind of see that and how that's represented in the lower panel um, where you can see, if I can put it really crudely, just how much we'd need to upscale our low carbon energy supply by 2100 if we were to aim for a certain level of emissions or RCP. And these pathways were kind of revolutionized in AR6. So you can see that we now have a new categorization from C1 to C8 on the left uh, with their indicative levels of warming. Uh, and on the right, they're actually expanded to show these sort of new uh, illustrative mitigation pathways or IMPs. Uh, and these are just here. There are five of them in total. And there's a nice table in our executive summary, our, uh, sorry, our technical summary, uh, which summarizes them. Uh, but briefly, the five uh, illustrative mitigation pathways just here show different kinds of ways that we can uh, limit warming, whether that's with an emphasis on strengthening of policies, negative emissions, lower demand, etc. So more time has actually been spent on this story, and it seems more relevant, I suppose, to daily life. And it's certainly more digestible in my experience for the public. Um, but also the policy landscape has changed a lot since AR5 and we've obviously got the Paris Agreement uh, and we'll work on the SDGs as well. So before I jump into the messages I just want to show you one last figure uh, and I hope I'm not butchering this for those IPCC authors who are with us <laughs> um, but you can see that there's been a lot more integration of design experts in this cycle as well because there's more uh, complex concepts integrated into this kind of pathways figure. Um, but it's still really clear, I think. Uh, so not only do the AR6 pathways give us this sort of suite of options, like I mentioned, um, but they also give us milestones, perhaps that's the right way to put it. And the figure here demonstrates the link between the scenarios and when net zero specifically is reached. Uh, and this wasn't done as far as I know in AR5. So for, for scenario C1, you can see that's pathways below 1.5 degrees um, with low or no overshoot. It's cut off, sorry, it's cut off the legend, which was over here. Um, but yeah, pathways below 1.5 with no or low overshoot. Uh, then you've got net zero greenhouse gas emissions reached towards the end of the century, whereas net zero CO2 emissions are reached in the early 2050s. And that's a really big key message that comes from this report. And that's heavily reported on as well in the media. And similar messages are obviously available uh, for other scenarios. I've just put, I'm just, I'm just highlighting C1 here. But okay, what I want to do is actually put this, these findings in terms of who we communicate this stuff to. Um, so obviously, IPCC's key audience is policymakers. Um, and in terms of how we communicate with them is very varied depending on their level of expertise. Um, some are very experienced with IPCC reports and others have in house policy experts to help them. We also work a lot with the press and media, particularly when the report is released. So a lot of the uh, the scenarios messages get turned into sort of high level takeaway or take home messages, which I'm going to go through in a sec. Um, and those are sometimes broken down into more specific analyses and people or sorry, um, publications like Carbon Brief will do that. But most people don't read Carbon Brief as in the general public. So their understanding is really filtered through uh, the media or through social media, unless they have access to a, a scientist, unless one of, they're one of your family members, perhaps. Um, but I think for the general public, there is still this question of what are scenarios? And hopefully I can come back to that at the end. Now, in terms of the press and media stuff, I just want to demonstrate how the scenarios work from the Working Group 3 report was broadly reflect, reflected in some of the media coverage of our report. Uh, and James is going to go into this across the three Working Group reports. So I'm just going to talk about ours just briefly. So here's a headline from The Guardian. And not all headlines were like this. I have admittedly picked a pretty big one. Um, but uh, some, some headlines actually covered other aspects of the report. Uh, you know, like the, some of the sectoral applications, for example, but many had, had headlines like this as well. So it's now or never, if the world is to stave off climate disaster, says IPCC. And some of this comes directly from the report. You can kind of see the through line, but not really in those words. And what we actually said was that without immediate and deep emissions reductions, 1.5 would be beyond reach. 
And then we gave the findings uh, from the scenarios experts um, from you, which uh, sort of talks about what else that entails. So we've given the, the lines for 1.5, emissions peaking before 2025, and also the, the lines for two degrees Celsius. I won't go into too much depth here because we don't have that much time. Uh, but basically, you can you can kind of see how, as our co-chair says, it is now or never. Um, 1.5 or 2 degrees is sort of now or never because 2025 is just around the corner, which is when they need to peak. But we certainly don't use uh, the words climate disaster. So in a way, um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is the point of this is to show how a scenario's message becomes aggregated into this kind of headline for public consumption. This is a pretty... Uh, a pretty high level example, but th there are many other examples kind of like this uh, in headlines, but also just throughout the reporting of the IPCC Working Group 3 report. Okay, and that leads me to some of the challenges um, to the scenarios community and for the scenarios community, and I, I guess as an extension, IPCC. Uh, the first one is, I guess it's a bit obvious, but it's really complex. It's challenging to explain the intricacies of scenarios work to people. And in AR3, they had a really nice, uh, the experts had a nice description of scenarios as societal visions of the future, which I think has uh, kind of gotten lost with this, this idea that these are projections. Um, but the work that goes into developing these visions for the future is not simple, and the way that we present them can appear really complex. Uh, another challenge is that IPCC especially can't do it all, um, and I suppose scenarios can't do it all. So how do experts pick and what's important to include and highlight? And I know this is being developed over time uh, with more research coming about and more assessment from the IPCC, but we still need to be able to explain that choice. There's this interesting article from Yale that I've put up uh, on screen here around uh, being criticized for not including access to birth control specifically as a topic um, in uh, scenarios that consider population growth and how curbing population growth can cut emissions. I thought that was kind of interesting. I'd be interesting. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as well. And then related to this, um, which scenarios uh, do we focus on and who chooses them? So at the moment, IPCC experts are kind of in the middle of political issues um, and the emissions trajectories and the future pathways that we use are really interesting to policymakers and that's at the national and the international level. So that means for us that we get questions like uh, what is the most realistic pathway to follow and um, as you are creating the pathways do you also have a say in policy making? Those are really difficult questions to answer uh, and not uh, they're not black and white. And bear in mind, the IPCC reports are actually reviewed by governments and in consultation with governments, and we do receive their comments. So it's not solely authors uh, selecting the content necessarily. Okay, I'm running out of time, I realize that, uh, but very briefly, a few more challenges for IPCC and beyond. Uh, questions about how scenarios line up with a just transition. This article in uh, The Lancet I found super interesting. You may have already heard about that. Uh, we also have a global remit at IPCC, but uh, that means that we provide a global assessment and there's questions around how uh, useful scenarios are for people working at a local level with their communities or even in certain regions. And then finally, the age-old question of how realistic certain aspects of IPCC assessments actually are, whether that's uh, uh, including things like RCP 8.5, which has been done to death, uh, or uh, even assumptions around technology uses in some of the in some of the scenarios, particularly ones that maybe haven't been proven at scale yet, or are still novel technologies. Um, so to close, I just want to go back to that question I asked earlier on behalf of the public, which is actually, I think, the bigger question, aside from all those other issues, which is what are scenarios? Because there's a really big gap in public understanding of what the um, nitty gritty scenarios research actually is. And I do feel like a better understanding of scenarios work and this community uh, could be of some help to solving those challenges I've mentioned. Um, and it's not really top secret stuff, but it seems like we've skipped over this explanatory phase, which was, like I said, done really well back in AR3 and AR4, but 15 years later, the world is a very different place. And there's a lot more public scrutiny um, of climate related research and decision making too. Uh, but still, I do wonder how we can bridge that gap. So I put some suggestions on screen, and I know a lot of a lot of these are already taking place, and the community is already involved in this. Uh, but yeah, some things to think about. And then finally, we're going to be at COP27. Uh, we have one of the first, I think, one of the first publicly available explanations of the Working Group Three scenarios. So I will be listening in closely to learn something. Uh, and feel free to join us. There's a link in my presentation. Thanks. I'll pass back to you, Catherine.
Thank you, Siggy. And I think we'll move right on to Arlene and then um, we could take a couple of questions for IPCC right after that if there's time. Um, and otherwise, we'll move right on to James. So. Arlene. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm also here talking about a similar topic as Siggy, um, but I will be doing it from a little bit different perspective. So um, I'm a graphics officer in the synthesis report. Um, I'm also a non-expert. I, I come not from a science background, but from a visually communication info design background. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about visual communication and my own journey through this process. So I've been working with the synthesis report for about a year, um, and that has involved a number of my own aha moments as I've struggled with the content um, to understand some scenarios just to the level of being able to then visually communicate them um, together with the, the authors. Um, so a few of these aha moments, for me, it was um, really great to see color standards applied. So for the SSPs, and then later on when I understood how these relate directly to these specific five scenarios, very high to very low um, emission scenarios. Um, so the consistency in, in using, see these, seeing these different color combinations and inline graphs really helped me understand that these are the same type of information that's being presented. Um, another moment that was um, helpful for me it was understanding that, oh, SSPs represent a whole variety of societal variation. It's not just emissions and temperature. There's a lot more behind them. Um, so that was also helpful in my work. And similar to the, the earlier example of color consistency, so seeing these categories of temperature, having consistent colors applied, my, my brain starts to pick up, okay, this is a visual language. So I'm able to, to see that we're talking about categories of color, um, sorry, categories of temperature through these specific color combinations. Um, then briefly some challenges that I, I'm still learning. <laughs> so I'm still encountering these. Um, and this one, first one might be a little bit general IPCC. Um, when you look across the, the graphs in, in the reports, I'm just gonna click through some here. So to those of you experts on the call, these may have really specific um, meanings. As you look at these, you may know exactly what they're, they're showing. Um, for most of us non-specialists, looking at all of these different graphs and different scenarios, um, we start to see a lot of patterns, like the graphs are going to the right and up, or they're going to the right and down. Um, so it's not necessarily the, the detail maybe that you're hoping at a glance things convey. Um, so even just removing the, the titles from these, um, it becomes really challenging for a non-expert to, to look at all of these graphs and at a glance understand what they mean. Um, so things like adding icons to, to at a glance clarify what the axes mean can help um, non-specialists better basically lower the cognitive load so that you know all of us have a limited amount of information that we can hold in our brains at one time when we're trying to decipher something. Um, so any techniques we can use to lower the cognitive load of these complex visuals can really help non-specialists. Um, an another challenge I encountered was the differing language. So um, science seems to use really specific language. Um, for an example, and another part of um, work with IPCC, um, before I came to IPCC, I sort of used the idea of vulnerability and exposure interchangeably. And then working with the scientists, I, I came to, to understand that, no, those words have very specific term um, meaning, and they're measured in very specific ways. So whereas you know, my, in my, my liberal arts background, I would have um, kind of said, oh, these words seem very similar, um, but science says, no, they're very different. Um, however, and, and Siggy touched on this as well, um, across the reports, there's a lot of different ways that we're seeing scenarios pop up, projections, models, sometimes they're referred to as um, climate model or illustrative scenarios, pathways, SSPs, RCPs. And as a non-specialist, it's challenging to figure out, okay, are we talking in general about this idea of scenarios or is this particular sentence or phrase referring to a very specific um, 
type of scenario, this uh, scientific meaning of it. Um, uh, another challenge that I'm still struggling with is the IPCC audience. So we know it's policymakers, um, and there's a lot of discussion of, are we trying to go for the specialist audience or the non-specialist? Um, I think in general, the, the desire is to reach non-specialists through our figures, our graphs. Um, and the, but of course, the, the process of how the report is approved, it's, it's approved by specialists, by the experts. Um, so that nuance is, is challenging to navigate. And, and something that's maybe an emerging aha for me is that maybe our IPCC figures are really just tools for policymakers and others to then kind of recreate or, or um, simplify in order for them to communicate to scenarios to non-expert audiences. Um, so a couple opportunities that I see to visually communicate IPCC scenarios. We already touched a little bit on using color as visual language. So using that consistently can help people understand and, and learn, build understanding over time to learn meaning. Um, indicating axes at a glance for common variables, maybe using icons for things like temperature and gases. Um, also an idea to, to make ingredients of the SSPs more clear. Um, so how much of different emissions, adaptation, et cetera. And maybe I think Siggy touched on you know, this idea of maybe we do need more of an explainer um, to give people that background knowledge and, and ideally, a lot of us are visual thinkers and visual learners. So visuals can be a great way to, to show what goes into the behind the scenes. But that said, not all audiences may actually need to know detailed understandings of the science behind the scenarios. So it's really important um, to evaluate what's, what's necessary for each audience. And that helps us visual designers um, to communicate as well as other communication professionals. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you all. Thanks, Eileen. Um, so we're running a little bit behind, but we do have time at the end for questions. So if there's no immediate questions, then I'll let James and, and Susie get started. I don't see any hands. So James, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Um... Uh, very much, uh, Catherine. Um, so we're looking, as, at Catherine, as Catherine mentioned, at how scenarios are reported uh, in, in the media, in a wide section uh, of the media. And I should just flag, flag up straight away that <clears throat> I led the research, but Susie Marshall, who's also on this, this call, who's an intern uh, with the IPCC, did a lot of the coding of the articles and also uh, presenting uh, uh, and designing the slides. So what was the context uh, for the study that we did? Um, we had an initial meeting with Anna from the TSU and Jan from Cicero in Norway. And this is one of the key points that they stressed in that initial meeting, that scenarios are not a description of what is going to happen or what is real or a series of recommendations. They are a range of possibilities based on different assumptions. So that helped to think about what were we going to test by looking at the media. And another uh, uh, piece of information or data that informed the context for our study is the result of a, of a small survey that Catherine did with uh, climate scientists in the scenario world, looking specifically or answering the question, what do the media get wrong when reporting on climate change scenarios? And they pointed out four things, uh, a misunderstanding or a mixing up of predictions versus projections or what if investigations, a misunderstanding like the, the, the quote above that scenarios are recommendations or truth. Thirdly, a focus on impacts and fear, high impact, worst case, apocalyptic scenarios, which we call hard deadline uh, scenario, uh, descriptions, um, which were very common, as I'm sure many of you are aware, in the reporting of the IPCC 1.5 report uh, of 2018 when the headlines 12 years uh, left before doom hits us or catastrophe hits us was, was very, very common. And then finally, the lack of coverage of uncertainty in the models, lack of agency and lack of uh, discussion of choices. So these helped us to 
formulates a series of research questions to address in our analysis of the media. I won't go through all of them, but the top three are the most important. Do the media really mention and address the scenarios uh, described in the different working group uh, reports? And when they do, how do they describe them or characterize the different scenarios? And in particular, what sort of language uh, are they using when they're talking about scenarios? For example, do they use the word predictions or forecast? Or they, do they use the sort of IPCC, very common words of projections, futures or pathways? Then thirdly, do they report the range of scenarios or do they focus down on a binary framing, either one option as opposed to another, such as deadline narratives? Then a, a couple of quick other questions was how much um, criticism did uh, the scenarios get in the media and how good are the media at describing accurately uh, or at all the uncertainty in the scenarios? So this is how we did it. Um, as you can see, um, we looked at English language online media. It may be of interest to all of you that after television, which is by far the most common way of people in most countries receiving climate information, the second most common is uh, online uh, media. So that's what we focused on. We looked at the five most popular online news online sites in the UK the USA and India. For Africa, we used many more media outlets. I think it was 28 to uh, improve uh, our sample size for Africa and bring it up to the size of the others. But we also threw in Reuters because we knew that Reuters, A, cover the IPCC reports a lot and B, get quoted all around the world. So we looked at uh, the coverage uh, they had on the day of the release of each working group report, but also a couple of days after. You may say, well, why did you include working group two when there's not much about scenarios? Well, actually, when we looked at the media coverage, there was a lot of discussion and mention of um, scenarios. And the key data, the key point of, uh, of the key numbers, the bottom right hand corner, we looked at 252 articles. So that's by content analysis standards, that's a lot of articles. And we did all the coding manually. We did not use computational methods, which my experience having done an awful lot of content analysis is uh, much more um, accurate. And we used a code book with 32 variables. So it's very, very detailed analysis. And we got an awful lot of results and I'm going to, going to pick five or six of them, but it's worth really stressing that in the written report that we're going to do, there'll be much more details uh, of um, all the results and all the questions um, that we addressed. But to start with, if you look at the graph uh, on the um, left hand side, we did a very simple counting of the word scenario. And if you look at the working group, the column on the left, working group one, and the columns are all broken down according to either regions or news agencies, you can see that nearly half the articles actually did include the word scenario in working group one. That dropped down in working group two and working group three, uh, as you might imagine. But at least um, the journalists do use the word scenario, which we thought was quite interesting. And the second thing we looked at was actually, do they include some sort of concept of a range of futures, even though they might not be using the word scenario, is there some either explicit or strongly implicit idea or notion of a range of futures that are facing the world. And again, uh, in over half of the articles for working group one, they had some sort of presence of that concept. Working group two was actually quite high. And when we dive down into the data, it, it appears that actually in the African sample, there was a lot of description of different climate impacts under different warming levels. And that was one of the reasons why that figure is quite inflated and then lower for um, working uh, um, group three. So you can see the big takeaway there is yes, journalists do use the word scenario. And yes, actually, there is some sort of idea or concept of range of scenarios. However, and it is a big however or, or but, right across our sample, and remember that's more than 250 articles from four different regions, uh, there was very little explanation of how scenarios are calculated very little mention of the specific uh, 
term or um, uh, abbreviation SSP and virtually no detailed explanation of what is an SSP is. There was no discussion either of how SSPs are different from previous ways of calculating pathways such as uh, um, RCPs. And you, I don't think that's massively surprising because for a general audience, as has already been said in the previous um, presentations, the journalists are going to be thinking, well, do, do my does my audience really need to have this level of detail? However, there were a couple of exceptions, and one of them is up on the chart now, where an explainer by Reuters, uh, the UN Climate Report's Five Futures Decoded, which was published on the same day that the report was released on, uh, um, or, uh, in August, I think. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see the five different scenarios which were outlined. But the point here is, this was very much the exception um, rather than the rule. However, there was a slightly different story when it came to visualization of scenarios. This is an example um, of the BBC adapting material, source material from the SPM for working group one. And as you can see, they're trying to, in, to use the, the, the phrase of the previous uh, speaker. I think they're trying to uh, reduce uh, the cognitive overload and try and make it as simple as possible and adapt some of the IPCC graphs. You can see it on the right in the circle, they use the phrase different possible scenarios and they describe a couple of them, future with intensive fossil fuel use and future based on sustainability. And there are quite a number of examples where the visualization of scenarios was common in the online uh, news coverage. And it was in, in some ways more detailed than it was in the actual text. There were some very few examples of the use of SSPs. This is actually a reproduction of the IPCC graph that was in Sigge's um, uh, uh, presentation, actually surprisingly from um, the Daily Mail. I say su surprising because for me as a general reader and non-specialist, that's an awful lot going on there to try and understand. So I was quite surprised that they included this and several other similar IPCC graphs. Unfortunately, uh, in my view anyway, if you look at the bottom, they actually added this graphic for the UN, UN report shows scientists prediction of future emissions, which is a shame because as we all know, um, the IPCC uh, does not use that word. So moving on to more of the results, we then did another fairly simple exercise. We wanted to see what sort of language um, they used when uh, me, the journalists used when they were describing um, the scenarios. And we did a contrast between the use of the two, two words predict or prediction and forecast with futures, pathways, and projections. We could have chosen other words, but these were the, the, some of the most, or if not the most, uh, common. There was very little of a phrase which I agree with, see, you might be quite useful visions of the future or societal visions of the future. But you can see the results. On the left hand side is the results for working group one. So it's quite, for me anyway, it's quite surprising that around a quarter of the articles still were using the phrases prediction and forecast, even to the extent of uh, saying the IPC models predict X, Y, and Z. But, and I guess it's quite a big but, futures, pathways, and projections were twice as present. Working group two, fairly similar uh, results. But interestingly, I think working group three, where predictions and forecasts were hardly used at all compared to future pathways and projections. And you may want to reflect on why that was the case. One possible reason is that actually in the SPM, uh, in the box describing scenarios, you know, there's a phrase, it's sort of buried, but it does specifically say, these are not predictions or forecasts. That may have had an impact because we know from other research that what journalists use it probably in order of priority is the press release, the SPMs, the press conference and the tweets. So quite a few journalists I know from personal experience do actually read the SPM. So maybe by actually stating out loud as it were in the SPM, these were not prediction and forecast that influenced the results. So we looked at several descriptors for how the scenarios are described. One of them was, do they use the phrase low emissions, medium emissions, high emissions, worst case scenario, best case scenario, and pessimistic, optimistic scenarios. And uh, I'm sure you guys know much better than I which are the best to use in what context, but these are the results. 
Working Group 1 used quite a variety, as you can see. Working Group 2 uh, used also uh, the first two quite a lot, but didn't use pessimistic, optimistic. And then in Working Group 3, um, I can't see the slide, unfortunately, but in my memory is that uh, there was a lot of the use of worst and best. And I'm not sure why that was the case, but maybe you, some of you might have the answer. We also looked at what, uh, how, when they were describing the scenarios, did they actually say how many scenarios were looked at? Uh, and, and that, unsurprisingly, for working group one, uh, quite a few of the articles did mention uh, there were five scenarios. And obviously, for working group two and three, where a different type of um, scenario, or at least a different way of describing scenarios we use, at least in working group three, uh, there was much less um, uh, pinning down how, num how, much, uh, how many scenarios were looked. Uh, were looked at in detail by the IPCC. We also looked at timelines. Did the journalist include always um, a timeline like uh, by mid-century or end of century or by 2030 or by 2050? And in very br broad terms, the full data details would be in the final report. They did use it quite a lot in working group one, but it was very surprising in working group three, in my view, that um, the timeline was very often completely left out in the reporting. So for example, they would say three degree warming, but not three degree warming by the end of the century, which uh, may have implications for how the communication. Then finally, uh, we looked at uh, what Siggy began to talk about, the presence of a binary framing, because the importance of this is, of course, if you present it very strongly as either or, you are not capturing the diversity of different scenarios. It's slightly confusing because we included in that chart both what we call hard deadline narratives and softer uh, versions of the binary framing. So those numbers are quite inflated. So on the left hand side, you have examples of what we call hard deadline uh, reporting, which where there's a specific date or a different specific timeline before which action has to be taken, otherwise catastrophe and doom. What is interesting for the first time, at least in, in my experience, there's quite a number of times where authors, IPCC authors, were actually quoted as saying, we are not talking about a cliff edge. In other words, they were debunking or rejecting the idea of a hard deadline narrative. And if you take out the ones where it was rejected, then those numbers go down a bit for working uh, group one and I think working group three. The softer versions, it's now on Never, for example, which got very widely uh, quoted, as uh, Siggy said, but not in the context of uh, uh, climate disaster in the case of, uh, of the actual quote, that it's now or never um, phrase got a lot of pickup uh, in working group three, as indeed did the quote about a rapidly disappearing window in working group two. Uh, from Hans, from working group, uh, the co-chair of working group two. Now you can have an interesting discussion, is that type of binary framing of now or never helpful or not, or in what context is it helpful? But it is the case that forms of binary framing are still very common, but the hard deadline narrative was much less common than we thought compared to uh, the 1.5 reporting. So some other quick key observations. It surprised me, I've done a lot of work in this, in this space, there was no presence of any organized skeptical group questioning the scenarios in any of uh, the articles. So for example, in the past, um, they've, uh, uh, they've often criticized you know, the IPCC for doom mongering uh, and, when, and the worst impacts haven't happened. But there was none of that this time around, at least in our, in our sample, right across uh, the three working groups, at least in our sample. There was very little doubting the credibility of the IPCC in general, except for one article in the Indian sample, which was questioning the use of the 1980 baseline and quote, the choice of scenarios that do not consider global, global equity and regionally differentiated mitigation. But in general, the journalists were very trusting and reproduced the messaging and the messages of uh, the IPCC and very little criticism. And then finally, very little uncertainty, the use of the word uh, uncertain around the scenarios and the models, which has been found by other studies. Journalists for all sorts of interesting reasons don't like uncertainty. 
but there were other indications of uncertainty around the degrees of likelihood, very likely, quite likely, likely. Those were widespread. So here are some of the main uh, conclusions, just to bring out some of the aspects, but again, to stress that there will be more in the, uh, uh, the full report. The country differences were not particularly stark. There were some, but it was pretty uniform across all the regions that we covered. Key point, very few detailed explanations of scenarios and SSPs in general. Does that matter? And if you want more detailed explanations, what should you be thinking about? Concept and brief labeling of particularly in the working group what sorry, excuse me, working group one scenarios are often or more often found in graphs and figures. So it really speaks to what Arlene was saying. Can you produce figures uh, that are more user friendly for the media? Predictions and forecasts, those words did get actually used um, quite a lot more than we thought, but nothing like as much as. Uh, projections, uh, pathways, and futures. Visions hardly got used at all. There were, as I've just mentioned, very few, in fact, hard deadline narratives, but plenty of soft binary ones and very little contestation around the scenarios uh, and the models. So those are some of the main conclusions. I haven't deliberately put up any recommendations that follow from those conclusions, uh, partly because we want to hear your um, uh, points of view, uh, partly because it, we need to read uh, more literature uh, and um, partly because we need to really uh, uh, finish the actual um, report. But I would be very happy to answer some suggestions that occur to me as a result of it. So thank you very much. And just again, um, hats off to Susie Marshall, who did a lot of the heavy lifting around um, the coding and the presentation. So thanks very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, Susie. All right, we are still running a bit behind, but if there is time for one question, if anyone has a question, and otherwise we can. Okay, let's take a question from Vanessa. Hi, thank you very much for um, the seminar and also um, for the presentation, James, that you just gave. I was curious whether or not the way we use words like prediction, forecast, um, in other contexts outside of IPCC and climate are perhaps influencing the way that journalists decide to use those words when they talk about what they're seeing in the IPCC reports? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm not sure how you would go about answering that, um, but I think there are journalistic drivers why those words also get um, used quite a lot. If you're reporting on working group one, which is all about um, different futures and different scenarios. It might be as simple as actually you use it, you don't want to keep saying projections, you don't want to keep saying uh, 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 um, futures, you want to find a diversity. And you might think that, well, actually, even though it's a wrong term, um, that uh, your audience in other contexts would uh, understand those uh, uh, terms better than projections is quite a different word, futures. Um, pathway certainly, you know, it's not easy for a general audi audience. Whereas, of course, forecasts, everybody watches the, the weather forecast. So, you know, you could be tempted as a journalist, even though you may or may not know it's wrong to use that. And predictions, uh, I'm not sure where you would get that from. I think what's really interesting, and we will be looking at the other literature, is where those words are commonly used in audience understanding of futures or scenarios outside of the climate change world. So for health or, or um, all sorts of other scenario planning, to what sort of vocabulary is used when you're explaining health outcomes, for example, even though, of course, there are uh, important differences. So it's a really good question. And that's not a great answer, but um, those are sort of some of the things that you probably have to do some qualitative work with journalists to understand why they use the words that they do. Thank you. It might also be um, worth noting that I think um, the word prediction was used quite a lot when it came to specific uh, impacts of climate change, such as uh, sea level rise. And so it was used to describe different predictions of sea level rise um, or the term IPCC model predicts came up quite a lot as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That, I think that's what was surprising, given that that phrase did not appear in any of the official uh, IPCC uh, communicating of the working group reports that the models predict, and yet it was quite common 
in the journalistic reporting of it. So you may, one may want to reflect why is that and how can you avoid it? I'm sorry to come in for one, oh, okay. sorry. I was just to say one last point was that I just checked and the word visions um, did not come up at all across any of the samples as well. Great. So let's um, let's move on to make sure that we get a chance for all of our other speakers to speak. But if others have reflections that you want to share with James, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll also have time for discussion at the end. So our next speaker is actually, we've been talking about journalists and journalism. So now we're gonna hear from a journalist. Shreya Jay is the deputy editor for energy and infrastructure for Business Standard India. And she was actually recommended to speak by some of our colleagues in working group three um, who are really impressed with her coverage of, of the recent IPCC reports. So Shreya, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, as she mentioned, uh, as we have been talking about here, how journalists are, uh, you know, what, what is their view towards IPP, IPCC and climate reporting. Um, my, my focus area today in this discussion would be South Asia and how it can be the subject and audience for climate discourse. And before I dissect these two, uh, just very quickly, why South Asia is a sample size? Because I, being a journalist based out of India, this uh, this my uh, whatever I speak is from my observation and my discussions with uh, journalists across South Asia, especially in the neighboring countries, uh, because we are the first in terms of facing the impact of climate change. These geographies will face the highest amount of impact. But in terms of mainstreaming the climate discourse, we are pretty low on the progress chart. <clears throat> Uh, I'll first start uh, South Asia as an audience of IPCC. What is the thought process of media towards climate news uh, reports uh, such as IPCC? If you were to read or hear or watch Indian uh, TV, uh, uh, conventional TV media, most dominant themes in the Indian climate reporting are renewable energy projects, policy development in the same, and global climate statements by Indian leaders. Words such as climate science, climate investment, loss and damage, just transition, barely find any attention. Uh, for instance, a very uh, recent example being that the Indian Prime Minister, along with the United Nations Director General, launched the LIFE mission last week, which did not find any major coverage across Indian media, despite the Indian PM being widely covered by the media. There was no credible writing on the mission itself. Uh, James mentioned about Reuters, uh, so I would like to here point out that a lot of climate news in these geographies, especially in India, uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan is driven by international wire agencies. Uh, whatever the tra traditional conventional media does here is reproduction of reports and less analysis. Uh, thankfully, the deniability for reports that IPCC produces or climate news is less. Uh, or I can say is missing, but so is authoritative reporting and writing on these subjects. Natural hazards are barely linked with climate impact. Case studies on the same do not get enough coverage or are used in analysis of such events. IPCC's findings, for instance, last year were covered by only a handful of print media, while TV media completely steered clear of it, despite the most urgent warnings in the three working group reports. Majority of the newsroom even failed to comprehend the scale and the seriousness purely due to lack of their own awareness and understanding. Climate continues to be a new urban subject for vernacular media and to an extent for a large scale of English TV media as well. In the print media, which took it up, there also it was more of a back page story, as we call it here, rather than the screaming page ones, as we saw in other countries, such as the United Kingdom and the US the newspapers. Climate discourse, uh, the one thing here to point out is that climate discourse in India has shifted from almost nothing to projecting renewable energy as a panacea for all the climate related crisis and impact. Same applies to our neighboring nations, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, in my engagement with South Asian journalists, climate as a beat or as a perspective to other general and business news is hardly a focus. Even the economic impact of climate is covered havoc wise rather than mainstreaming it. Um, a handful of print media and new age digital newsrooms have initiated healthy dialogue on climate change and related stories, but that remains to be very, very limited. And there are only a couple of digital news sites which focus on climate only, but their reach is limited. Coming to my second point of making South Asia the subject of the climate discourse for uh, given that it is a very fairly new topic for the South Asian media to cover, it is easier for media persons here to fall in the trap of, say, targeted, concise 
analysis offered by the comps, climate comps, rather than reading the scenarios oneself. Uh, it is difficult for newsrooms to correlate the findings with real life event, despite the IPCC addressing some significant case studies. For that matter, IPCC continues to remain one day, one, one off day reporting for most of the newsroom. Uh, region specific case studies need to be highlighted more and in isolation. A flood in Pakistan needs to be looked from the lens of water scarcity in the water security in the country uh, rather than global climate impact. Uh, you no know, cause taking a backseat over effect. Um, in most of the newsroom, despite the ignorance and the lack of scientific knowledge for climate reporting, there is, however, a growing thought process to blame the global north and get away with one's own inefficiencies. Uh, for this matter, historic pollution needs to be presented with loss and damage in poor and island nation, therefore highlighting the link as strongly as possible. Critical analysis of the announcements, targets, and demands of the developing world uh, need to be correlated. A lot of poor nations, including India, harp about their grand renewable energy targets, but has it made a difference on ground and at scientific level needs to be evaluated now. If such countries want to be in the big league net zero race, they can't be dealt with click gloves anymore. Having said that, a comparative analysis is also important. Uh, uh, I'll just quickly conclude by saying that the developing uh, nations, South Asian countries deserve an equal say in the climate de debate, but so do their issues, their fallacies, their demands, their successes, their failures should also be projected on a global stage and at the scientific level. Doom and gloom themes have worked in the recent past, uh, but it should hit closer home now. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. Great to hear from you. Are there any questions specifically for Shreya or shall I? Just a second. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. So our next, thank you. Thank you again, Shreya. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Dana Hudson. And so we're hearing here from like three very different perspectives. Andrew is a novelist and futurist, and he's actually written a novel that's set in the five different SSPs in 2050. And so I will let him tell you about it. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with this Iconics community um, since the, this book that uh, I published this year with Fordham University Press is, uh, there we go, um, would not have existed without the, the work of uh, you all on these scenarios. So um, I'm going to drop a couple sort of self-promotional links in the chat. Um, to make it easy for you to find my book if you're interested in my other work. Um, so a little background about how this came to be. Um, I kind of got into writing what's called climate fiction. Uh, in 2016, I co-wrote a story called Sunshine State about a rogue ecological mega project in Florida that won ASU's first climate fiction contest, Arizona State University's. And, you know, beginner's luck is a hell of a drug. So uh, I decided to keep writing fiction. I moved to Arizona for graduate school. And um, I could, I wanted to see if I could write some stories that engaged with and were useful to the science and policymaking happening around climate. Um, so it was there that I read about the SSPs. And my third, my first thought was, well, these are science fiction stories. Uh, I was really struck by the thematic parallels the SSP narratives have with well-developed well -developed speculative fiction tropes. You know, you, high inequality in SSP4 um, is explored in a ton of popular sci-fi. You know, there's that like, Matt Damon movie, Elysium. SSP5 had this sort of hyper-capitalism vibe that is sometimes used in novels like uh, Snow Crash or Jennifer Government. Um, and to a lay person, SSP3 feels like it's leading towards a kind of dystopian proto Mad Max situation, which I know all of you are probably a little sort of cringy about. Um, and SSP1 evokes a lot of uh, what's been showing up in recent utopian sci fi that is sometimes called solar punk, um, or in books like Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future. So uh, the SSPs show both the dystopian danger and the utopian possibilities at the same time. Not, not that sustain, the sustainability scenario is utopian, 
necessarily, but I think for a lot of us, there's a sense that uh, getting there would mean improving the world in, in a wide variety of ways uh, beyond just tackling climate change. Um, that's sort of the Naomi Klein theory and like this changes everything and so forth. Um, so that's not something that climate fiction uh, has really managed to do that often, to have these two possibilities held together. Um, books are kind of usually either pessimistic or maybe more kind of optimistic about how well we navigate the crisis. And I really like the idea of using SSPs as a guide to create a work of fiction that shows both of these as live, as live possibilities. And that goes beyond the good to bad spectrum to explore a broader possibility space with different flavors of, of socioeconomic climate response. Um, so I set out to uh, write a set of stories directly inspired by the SSPs. I visited uh, some folks in Yasa on a, a trip to Vienna, uh, discussed the project. And you know, one problem that came up is that while scenarios are kind of general and planetary, stories are uh, pretty much always particular and shaped around a particular place, time, set of characters. If the goal was to illustrate the differences between the pathways, then we had to find a way to make the stories more comparative um, than contained works of fiction usually were. So I, I ended up treating the stories kind of like an experiment, uh, eliminating as many variables as possible. Um, I set them all at the same time in the 2050s in the same place, Buenos Aires, and I set them all at the COP, uh, at COP 60 to be exact. Uh, so the political debate in the stories could have an international scope rather than uh, focusing on the climate impacts or adaptations or responsibilities of one city or country. I also mix up the order. I didn't go one, two, three, four, five. I went two, five, four, three, one, uh, which created kind of an emotional meta arc across the book flowing from the familiar toward the sort of more, uh, more of, a, of a dark, uh, place and finishing with a with a happy ending, um, and you know I I started writing this book um, in 2019, uh, so I use uh, the the sort of original five and not the the sort of one sort of one B uh, scenarios uh, that ended up in in the AR six, um, and I think the original five had a, a you know have a conceptual spread that was really useful for um, uh, for, you know, crafting fiction around. So uh, each story includes the same set of four characters and uh, the same climate shock at the core of the plot, a superstorm hits the cop. Uh, and, you know, funnily enough, this was in part inspired by my own experience of uh, being at the Scenarios Forum in Denver when it was hit by that bomb cyclone. Maybe some of you were also there and had to trudge through the sleet and uh, get snowed in for a couple days. Uh, but the story plays out differently based on which SSP we are in. Uh, the world is handling climate issues in different ways. Uh, the city manages the storm in different ways. And, and the characters are different people living different lives shaped by the opportunities and challenges created by the next three decades of diverging climate policy and investment. So a character who in one story is an activist is in another story a refugee and in another story is an international pop superstar, uh, an entrepreneur in SSP5 is a gang leader in SSP4 and a soldier in SSP3. And the cop, which is kind of the fifth character, is a different sort of event each time, ranging from a, sort of the plotting negotiation in SSP2 to a frenetic green biz trade show in SSP5 to an exclusive Davos-esque plutocratic gathering in four. Uh, in SSP3, the UN is gone, so it's just Ringo Academics meeting to document the slide into the hothouse. And in SSP1, it's become a more diverse and democratic space for global economic planning and collaboration. Um, so I, I even had fun kind of changing up the tone of the story uh, to match what I felt like was the, the under theme of the narratives for each scenario. Uh, 
SSP2 is, is cynical, cut through of hope and disappointment. SSP5 is titled Too Fast to Fail. It's this like, hyped up brand soap name droppy Silicon Valley Wall Street energy, a world of its foot on the gas that's really trying hard not to look at the consequences coming down the pipe after it. SSP4 evokes the materiality of poverty and inequality, contrasted with the sort of courtly airs of high society. SSP3 grapples of violence and hopelessness, kind of asking where did it all go wrong? Where did it all go wrong? And SSP1 is a bit more didactic in voice, trying to explore what a sustainable world might look like, while characters express a sort of that was close, whew, relief as they move on to the next challenges of climate repair and planetary management. And the remixing of characters, I think, is what really turned out to be super interesting about this methodology. I've seen and done scenarios based fiction before, but rarely do these works end up uh, using this kind of multiversal approach where the emphasis is on how challenges and opportunities created by different socioeconomic configurations create inflection points for us to become different people. Um, a lot of those projects uh, end up, you know, have sort of different authors writing different, uh, writing the different stories. Um, and so there's a little less focus on how the, the scenarios are kind of deliberately counterposed to draw contrast and how a shock to the system is handled or, or how, you know, what becomes acceptable versus what remains, uh, um, uh, what, what remains sort of a, a uh, what we absorb, I guess. Anyways, um, I, so I hope the field does more of this kind of writing because I found it really productive and I think the SSPs are a great place to start. And if anyone is interested in um, incorporating some sort of future version of, of fiction around um, the SSPs into future scenarios uh, work, uh, you know, please reach out. I'm sure, you know, myself and many others are in, in the sort of climate fiction space or are interested in that. So thank you. And, and please, I'd love for folks in this community to read my book. And if you do, I'd love to hear from you. And I'm pretty easy to get in contact with through my website, or if you're interested, you can ask for my email and, and all that. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. So yeah, so let's go ahead and move on to Kirsika and then we can have a discussion at the end we'll have enough time. Um, did you want to show the video or shall I shall I give it? Uh, I think you you need to show the video, but I can uh, show the tool uh, like slides before that if that's okay. fine. Sounds yes. good. All right. So thank you for inviting me also to share some different perspectives. And I'm going to do that in the form of a five minute video that Catherine is helping me to show. Uh, due to technical issues, but uh, before going into that, just a couple of slides about my background to give a bit of perspective and context that uh, helps you maybe to understand the video, because that's not so much about the communicating the scenarios, but it's more about engaging uh, different people for creating the scenarios. Uh, so let me just uh, introduce myself through this uh, couple of slides. So I hope that you see it now. So I also actually have a background in academia, but it's the, in the field of design and more specifically uh, in the human centric design and the service design. And uh, I have been working with the human centric design uh, almost 20 years now in Finland and globally. And as I said, both in the academia and then, then the last uh, 10 years in the uh, consultancy side. Uh, in the we have the I'm working and uh, being a partner in the company called Hellon, uh, and we have uh, offices uh, both in Finland and in the UK. Uh, and uh, what we are doing, or what my daily business is more about, is about uh, working with different kind of organizations, both in the public and private sector, uh, through different kind of. Uh, uh, focuses. So, for example, one of the ways that I'm helping them is to uh, identify the focus and future direction uh, through different kind of innovation processes, uh, better customer and user understanding, uh, 
uh, or for example, helping to create better customer and user experiences or, or better service experiences uh, uh, through digital or, or multi-channel experiences, or then looking more into the company itself and uh, more in a strategic level to help them to, for example, uh, transform the way of thinking, not working more into the human-centered way compared to the more organizational or expert uh, oriented uh, way, for example. So that's just a really short background. Uh, and then uh, Catherine will uh, show the video, which is uh, we have been uh, developing in one of the global uh, research project funded by EU. But I think in the video, there's a little bit more yep. uh, about it. All right, do you see my screen? Uh, yes, at least I can see it. Great. Accelerating sustainability transitions requires imagination and creativity to concretize desirable future narratives. For this purpose, Helen designed the Sustainable Futures game that connects societal sustainability goals with everyday organizational contexts to help build organizations' capabilities for imagining alternative futures and plan their actions towards them. Especially in the context of environmental crisis, it seems like when we try to think about the future, we approach it either through dystopian narratives or through utopian dream worlds which both represent rather abstract views on the future. On one hand, dystopias embody the discouraging and horrific futures that we want to avoid. On the other hand, utopias represent the far-reaching dream worlds that we might not be able to reach. It seems more difficult for us to imagine the futures between the utopian and dystopian worlds, the desirable futures that are possible to reach but still radically different from the status quo, which has turned out to be quite a disruptive one. The Helen design team developed the design game through a participatory process during 2020 and 2021. The development of the Sustainable Futures game started from the need to help us collectively imagine desirable futures and potential pathways towards them. The purpose of the game is to help players co-imagine a desirable future state of a commonly decided city in 2030 through fictional storytelling and design prompts and thereafter backcast ways to tackle critical challenges to reach co-narrated future. The initial intention was to develop a physical board game. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences, a digital version was developed besides the physical board game. The game session starts with an introductory presentation by the facilitators to prepare the participants for the right mindset and introduce key terms and concepts of the game. In the first part, the players collectively write a fictional story which depicts a desirable near future state of 2030 for a selected city. The fictional story evolves through several collective tasks, including, for instance, visual probes, probing questions, and questions related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The main objective of this part is to facilitate a dialogue on desirable futures and collectively imagine a fictional story that integrates multifaceted characteristics of this future narrative, such as personal desires, societal norms or political structures. In the second part, the players identify critical challenges and barriers that restrict their co-narrated desirable futures from materializing. Finally, the game session results in concrete, action-oriented suggestions on what type of activities should be implemented today to overcome the identified barriers and move towards the co-imagined future. As the story is co-narrated, the outcome of each game session varies depending on the participants' interests and aspirations. After the game session, the players reflect on their experiences of playing the game with guided questions. This self-reflection helps the players formulate their key takeaways from the game session and provides valuable feedback for further developing the game. 
Design games provide a deliberate way of imagining alternative futures due to play qualities such as the tangible game materials, rules and structure that create a play spirit for the players. This play spirit, the so-called magic circle, helps the players step away from their positions and creates a foundation for mutual learning. The Sustainable Futures game has shown the potential to support a more holistic understanding of the interdependencies between different sustainability goals. Furthermore, it has helped the participants to better understand the long-term consequences of today's actions and facilitated discussion around desirable futures that go beyond the status quo. Helen plans to continue organizing new game playing sessions in the future and iterating the game approach further to steer our actions towards desirable futures. And maybe it's just the last comment here that I would like to highlight that it's not about the teaching game, but it's more about facilitating the dialogue and, and helping people to reflect and, and think about different perspectives for the more sustainable future. Thank you so much. So I think um, I see one question in the chat. Yeah. So maybe Richard, would you like to say your question or shall we read it for you? You're welcome, raise hands. O'Brien, oh, we have your hand raised as well. Um, yeah, ahead. should I jump in? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so first I wanna say this was great. I mean, uh, really the whole thing, very interesting. And we, we need, way more time than we have to talk about all of this. So we're, we're kind of stuck a little bit that way. Um, I did want to ask one question that kind of occurred to me during the, the IPCC part of this, but, but maybe is relevant to the whole thing. And that is, in the scenarios community, when, when we were first developing the SSPs, we thought explicitly about communication and decided and, and 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 we thought about it because as these were being developed we we're all like you know this is getting pretty complicated and how are we going to communicate all this and and the decision was that's not the goal the goal is that these are tools for the research community to help them do integrated studies meaning that that they have impacts in there and mitigation um feedbacks, policy, the whole thing. And so these are some different elements, some societal elements and climate futures that the research community put together. And, and what should be communicated in the end is the insights that we get as a result of that um, research. So I guess I have a couple questions. One is, I mean, I used to say, was that naive? Now, I guess I would say exactly how naive was it? Um, because obviously, right, we see all of this engagement with the scenarios themselves. It, it's turned out like definitely not possible to separate the insights from, from the scenarios themselves. That's one. But given where we are, you know, is it a good idea, for example, James mentioned that there were no stories explaining the details of the SSPs, like, maybe that's a good thing, right, because we don't want everyone to get lost in the details. Um, but it makes me kind of all of this makes me sort of rethink what what should we be aiming for in terms of communicating scenarios and sort of the methodology versus insights divorced from the scenarios. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether to give up <laughs> or to try to backtrack a little bit and not try to communicate so much about the scenarios. I'm muted, sorry. A few questions there. And I think um, maybe for the speakers could could raise your hand if you'd like to come in on that. And I, I, I would just come in first to say that I think that it, all of those questions, it depends on, on who is your audience. So I think there's probably a place for communicating the explanations of the, the SSPs themselves in detail, but also 
for those types of just communicating the insights? What did we find? What are the top level findings for a, a, a more general audience, perhaps? But I'd love to hear from, um, from James, from Arlene, from Siki, from Shreya as a journalist, uh, anyone who'd like to, to pop in? Well, I think I, I would agree that if it's seen through the prism of the media, if, if the IPCC or, or indeed the scenarios community is going to put so much emphasis on these different scenarios and, and what if assumptions, I think you're sort of almost duty bound to, to put a huge emphasis on communicating. And you can't put them, you know, I think the scenarios were mentioned at least 100 times, the word scenarios in each of the SPM. So, you know, it's a bit of a no brainer. You've got to think about, okay, how am I going to communicate them or to which audience am I going to communicate them? And as Catherine says, you know, when is it important? to uh, really explain them and go into detail and, and, and when isn't it. I don't think you can just be happy with just, you know, talking to each other about the insights when they're, you know, so uh, dominant in the, in, in the IPCC reports. To me anyway, the real question is what you really interesting, do you actually, how much do you really need to explain uh, when you're um, talking to a journalist? You know, is it gonna get in the way of a, in the way of a story and you just, it doesn't matter that they just kept to carbon brief or you know one Reuters article. Actually, what matters uh, much more is what we do about it and what are the uh, the future options, rather than you know going into great details about what all these different scenarios are and, and assumptions. Because from an audience perspective, for most audiences of the media, they're just going to be they're not going to engage with it. I don't think so. I think that's the real issue. Yes, you have to communicate, but you have to have a really nuanced think about what sort and what angles are you going to communicate about these scenarios? I hope that helps. Yeah, it's just, I think much trickier than any of us realized at the time, and we sh probably should have started to think about it from the beginning. Uh, if I may quickly add, I, I think uh, reducing scenarios, as you, as you mentioned, Brian, is of no help. Uh, be it for a seasoned journalist or for someone writing as many scenarios and as much of nuance understanding of a scenario actually actually helps you know you you were not re reproducing the scenarios as a news report you're understanding these scenarios you're understanding what the ipcc is trying to project there and you're trying to tell the general public you know they they it's not like they are the policy makers you're writing for all policy makers you're writing for general public you're writing for any and everyone who would play a role in in a country's climate action uh, let or more. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I, I will not comment on the language or how it is represented, but, but uh, you know, more nuance, more detail, and as many scenarios as possible geographically, uh, you know, especially geographically, I, I think it needs to be there. It very much needs to be there. So I think Susie, Arlene, and then Siki, I'm not sure if that was that already. Uh, I think also in, in response to your question, a lot of the media coverage seemed to um, take quite heavily from the press releases, from the working group reports. And so depending on how important it is, I think maybe putting in the press release a distinction uh, about language when talking about scenarios, whether or not that's to describe what a prediction or forecast is, and when it's accurate to use those terms, uh, might be something that would be helpful for journalistic coverage. And just to say, I agree with comments already. And I think that the more you can share about what goes into the SSPs can really just help build credibility and, um, and, and form that solid foundation for the explanations when, or the insights when you do communicate to a more general audience. I was just actually going to mention what Arlene said around um, credibility and also trust, because without providing that explanation, you're relying on a huge amount of trust from your audience, regardless of who they are. And I think there is some value to providing a detailed explanation and being clear about it and being transparent about it, even if you don't use all that information for a very, very general audience, but providing things like analogies uh, and basically explaining the overall process without going into the detail can still be helpful and can still give you some of that transparency so that when people have questions or uh, we call them tricky questions in IPCC, you can easily respond to them, right? You have something prepared uh, that they'll be able to understand. That would be sort of my suggestion. But also I think this is up to not just the researchers, but the comms professionals who help them to identify what those are and how to communicate those. Because it's a really difficult thing and not one person can do it or not one group can do it, yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, those are those are interesting um, responses, and it makes me think. So we have kind of yeah, inevitably you got to build the credibility and trust and the insights that you're actually drawing from them. The other that has been tricky and kind of goes to Andrew's book is I've had journalists ask me, you know, I look, I read all the IPCC stuff and I can't figure out what's the world going to look like in the future. Like the sum of all those SPMs doesn't really tell you what's the future going to look like. And I think, you know, Andrew's book starts to give us a sense of like what it would feel like, right, from a particular angle, but these worlds would feel differently. Um, and so it seems like that's another goal that we still have a ways to go on. Maybe I'll just jump in um, and had a, yeah, I mean, a big part of my project ended up being this kind of almost interpretive work um, of looking at the the narratives that had been written and then trying to be like, okay, well, what does this really mean? Um, and and also, you know, I, I had to write stories that felt um, a little more authentic to, to my own, you know, guesstimates of the future. And so there were ways in which, um, you know, the, the inequality scenario was much more about inequality between people than inequality between nations. It's just, I think, the way it's kind of currently formulated. Um, so there was kind of those, those sorts of adjustments made. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, well, uh, I'd be curious what, what people think uh, if it feels like they, they ring true to what you all had in mind when you were creating these, these uh, narratives in the first place. Go ahead. Thanks. I was just going to jump in and make a comment. Um, and I said it in my presentation, but it's really tricky because the way that I think the scientists, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking for other people here, see it is that it's not black and white. So they're not projections, they're visions. And we're sort of in the, in the process of making the future, right? We're, we're creating the future. So we can't really see what it's going to be like. Um, and the way I view the scenarios is that it's sort of like a like a map, but you only have the you only have the main roads, right? You don't have the little bits that take you off of it. And I think what the you know the book provides, Andrew, is you get kind of an example of what that would look like, and that's very satisfying for people because the IPCC reports don't really do that for you. They provide a suite of options, and scenarios do that as well. Um, I'm not sure how to sort of bridge the gap between those two things. Um, providing examples is really useful, and the Working Group Three report did that in that kind of sectoral way, where we actually took out, <clears throat> like for example, what would happen with the energy sector if you employed renewables. Um, but you can also do it at a society level, which Andrew has done in a in a fictional way. Uh, so. Yeah, that's kind of like my interpretation of it. It's just not black and white. And the the comment on the in the chat kind of reflects that. It's, it's always one way or the other and not not in between, which is yeah, hard to come to terms with. Yeah, maybe I think we're running out of time, but just one quick last point to add is um, in science communication and the study of science communication, there's a lot of talk about narrative and how people process information through stories and narratives. And there's a recent study um, in cognitive psychology and neuroscience looking at, at multi narratives that have multiple possible outcomes and that people actually gravitate towards these. Um, so this is all really new research, but I think if that's true, if we really do like narratives that give us a sense of possibilities, a sense of different possible outcomes, then the idea of scenarios could actually be a really useful way to communicate climate change um, in a different, yeah, choose your own adventure, exactly that kind of framing. So um, I just wanted to leave you with that as like, you know, we went from challenge, but I think the, the very concept of scenarios is a great opportunity within communication, so. Can I just add to that, that um, one thing that I tend to find scenarios really useful for is including not just a, a, a you know, what are we able to accomplish spectrum, but also a set of normative choices about deciding, you know, how we want our, the future to be. 
and and not just like okay we need to choose the better future but you know choose uh, a different like pace of life or a different um uh set of institutions that we find valuable and um you know that's the kind of of thing that i i think can be uh you know highlighted but is 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 then you know those those choices i think are really hard to necessarily mesh with the kind of work that you all are doing but it's it's something that is there in the um you know in the schema of of scenarios in general all right shall we wrap up i think we're right right over time i guess so thank we're you starting yeah so all right, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, thank you so much for listening to us. I know this is a little bit different from your normal Iconics webinar, probably. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you, especially to all the speakers who took the time to prepare your talks and to come and speak to us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.